Good morning and welcome. Today's Easter Sunday service uh, was prepared for us by the Reverend Barbara Allen, who is both the Supply Minister for Leemore Uniting and Heather and Dingley Uniting Churches. Unfortunately, Barbara was not able to be with us for the filming of this service because her husband is quite ill and has just had an operation. But we do want to thank her sincerely for putting together such a thoughtful and meaningful service. So let us come before the Lord. With Mary, let us approach the tomb. With Mary, let our surprise and grief be turned to joy. With Mary, we hear Christ call our names. Let us give thanks to our risen Lord who has triumphed over death. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Amen. Let us pray. O God, to you belong all praise and glory. Easter is a glorious season, a time to remember your power and your love. The stone was rolled away and our fears of death were rolled away as well. You brought life out of death and have promised that to us also. God of wonder, that the tomb should be empty on that Easter morning is as unbelievable to us as it was to Mary. That one should die and be raised again for all is beyond our comprehension. Yet though our minds be stretched beyond their limit, by the gift of faith we do believe. We praise the risen Jesus, alive and present in our midst. Because Jesus stooped to comfort the least of your people, those on the margin, the overlooked, we too have hope that you can lift our spirits when we despair. When we face troubled times, you comfort us, strengthen us and love us. Fill us with hope as we behold Christ's resurrection. The miracle of Easter shows us that nothing is impossible for you and that nothing in life or in death can separate us from your love. Alleluia. Amen. Singing is just such an important facet of our Easter celebrations that we really couldn't leave it out. So please join in at home if you'd like or just enjoy uh, the words and the music as we sing together, I Know That My Redeemer Lives. from John chapter 20 verses 1 to 18. 
Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not realise that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord, she told them, that she had seen these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There is a picture of the empty tomb with the stone rolled to the side. The caption reads, Missing, presumed dead. Missing, presumed dead. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entryway. The mood of the Easter season is a roller coaster of emotions, from grief and loss to waiting and patience. And finally, it is Easter Sunday, the most important day of the church calendar. Christmas is essential. We need the Son of God to be born. We need the death on Good Friday. But Easter Sunday is of most importance because if there was no resurrection, no empty tomb, then the baby Jesus remains just a baby and Good Friday just a day of death. We as Christians know that if there is no resurrection, we have nothing to stand on. We worship a risen Lord. This year, we cannot attend a church gathering, but the Alleluia's still abound in our hearts. We are still the church. He has risen. Alleluia. 
And yet, like the Christmas story, it is all too easy to rush through the Easter story. After a sombre Good Friday, we hurry through Easter Saturday, eager to get to the good part. But stop. Listen. We know that quote so well, take time to smell the flowers. Slow down. Slow down or you'll miss some jewels of the Easter story. In John's account, we hear that Mary came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. The gospel accounts of the first Easter are, to a degree, so familiar that we tend to merge them all together. John does not say why Mary went to the tomb, but it was not in order to anoint the body, as in Mark and Luke. In John's account, the preparation of the body to mask the odours and to show respect and devotion of family and friends had already taken place, carried out by Nicodemus. Mary goes to the tomb in order to grieve, away from the others, to weep in private. She comes to the tomb while it was still dark. John's is the only gospel to state that it was dark. Matthew and Luke say that it was dawn. Mark, that the sun had risen. John may be using the word dark to convey to us that Mary had not yet grasped what had actually happened. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. But all of the empty tomb means for Mary at this stage is that the body of Jesus has been stolen. She hadn't grasped the deeper significance. She saw seeing is believing, but not yet. How well do we see? Ever driven home and yet you can't remember how you actually got home? You were so intent on what was going on in your mind that you weren't really aware of what you were doing or seeing. How many of you have ever been on a familiar, maybe your daily walk, and yet not notice something that has been there for a long, long time? We see, but not see. Mary rushes back to tell the other disciples, Simon, Peter and John, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Although we are not told whether she looked into the tomb, Mary has assumed because of the removal of the stone that the body had been taken. Her concern was legitimate. Emperor Claudius had issued a decree stating that anyone who removed a corpse or robbed a tomb was subject to capital punishment. Would the disciples then be blamed for the empty tomb, for the removal of his body? Her time of grief turns to shock as she rushes back to report to Peter and John. Seeing is believing or seeing is not believing, or seeing is not seeing. The race between the disciples, Peter got there first, he didn't go in, but he peeked in and saw the linen wrappings where they were lying there. John wants to look more closely, not to just rush past. Peter sees a cloth, the linen shroud. The other disciples become a little braver, or may be more curious. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed. He looked, he saw, he believed. Believed what? Not that Jesus had risen from the dead. Nobody thought that. The text goes on to explain that they did not as yet know anything about the resurrection. 
Verse 9 says, For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So, having seen, having believed that Jesus was dead, but that Jesus' body had been stolen from the tomb, these two disciples returned home. They came, they saw, they went home. Seeing is not seeing. Seeing is believing one thing, but not another. They return home confused. Confused, seeing the grave clothes still in their places where the body had been, suggests that the body of Christ had not been stolen. Why would the grave robbers strip the corpse, neatly fold the grave clothes in the tomb and go off with a naked corpse? They returned home, confused. Think back to a time when you were grieving you may be in that state now. Think back to the beginning of your time of mourning. Often the most painful time is when you return home. The funeral is over. Friends and family leave, making sure you have enough food to keep you going, though you don't feel like eating and can't imagine you'll ever enjoy a meal again. All is quiet and then you see it her favorite chair the unfinished book lying on the table his work tools not put away his clothes in the wardrobe it's painful just like the folded linen a reminder of their presence of their earthly life they return home confused, but Mary stays. Mary stays to grieve. Verse 11 says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. She stayed weeping at this final outrage. Where have they taken the body of Jesus? Where can she find the body of her Lord? Where can she find the body of Jesus, because that's a big part of our love. We don't love humanity. We love those eyes, that hand, that touch, and it hurts. She wants the body in order to grieve, not to be plagued by thoughts of it having been stolen and what the thieves might have done with it, have they treated the body of Jesus with respect or has it been tossed away somewhere like so much rubbish? The sight of the stone rolled away, the folded linen cloths, the absence of the corpse did not move Mary to thoughts of the resurrection. She, like Peter, only knew of one possibility that they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Dead bodies do not simply disappear. Someone has to move them. Mary needs the body to help her in her grief. We understand that. Often after a death, a loved family member needs to see the body to have a viewing in order to believe or to see that the person has truly died. Even when Mary looks into the tomb and sees two angels in white, she said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Mary is so consumed with her grief. She does not see. In the other Gospels, the angels elicit fear or amazement from the women. But here, we stand looking on with compassion at Mary's deep grief, which is so strong that she does not see the miracle in front of her. She does not see the angels 
or the significance of that moment. And then, and then that amazing meeting when Mary meets Christ, whom she thought was the gardener. Before we judge her too harshly, haven't we all at some time in our lives mistaken someone for somebody else? Especially if we have been crying or preoccupied or the sun is in our eyes. Jesus asks the same question that the angels asked. Why are you weeping? For the third time, Mary repeats her concern about the theft of the body, still not recognizing Jesus. When she hears her name, Mary, the impossible, the incredible breaks through. Now she sees the one who had died now greets her and calls her by name, bringing the personal, her name, to this momentous event. He knows our names. The divine knows each of our names. Even when disasters abound around us, when we remain behind shut doors because of a virus that we can't see, he knows our individual names because, because he loves us. From the big picture, the universe, to the small, our own individual name, our small lives, seeing is believing. Mary's need to see the body of her beloved Jesus does not have room for the miracle that has just happened. The voice of Jesus has called to her from across the gaping chasm of death. Like a voice that shatters glass, the voice of Jesus has shattered Mary's world, called her forward to new possibilities, to a new future. That same voice shatters our world, if we let it. Mary is now able to obey, to tell the others, I have seen the Lord. She has moved beyond her preoccupation with a corpse, with a body, to an encounter with the risen Christ. While the other two, Peter and the other disciple, were the first to enter the tomb and see, it is Mary Magdalene who was the first person to witness, to testify to the risen Lord, the first to testify to a new relationship. In the Gospel of John, the emphasis is upon the restoration of the personal relationship broken by the events of Friday, upon the way Mary Magdalene and later the disciples are brought into a new and deeply intimate relationship with the risen Lord. Seeing is believing. Like Mary, when we encounter the resurrection, we see something. It might be the, the grave cloths. Or we might notice the stone has been rolled back. Or the angels. I think I would have noticed the angels. We may hear something, footsteps, or our name. But nothing is as yet explained to us. The angels didn't let Mary know how it happened. Jesus, the risen Lord, didn't tell her either. Really, who can explain the resurrection? Some things just defy explanation. We just have to believe. We see and we believe. We follow in Mary's footsteps, for we come here to find Jesus, but we don't find Jesus. No, instead the good news on this Easter day is that Jesus calls your name, shatters the world, returns and intrudes. We are the ones who have been found. We have been given new life. We are the ones who are to listen, to listen, to hear our names. The caption, missing, presumed dead, 
has been rewritten. Now it reads, found alive, found alive. Jesus is not missing. But there are some who still miss Jesus, who do not see. Jesus breaks into the world, returns, intrudes. He calls your name and he finds you. Alleluia. Amen. As I said on Palm Sunday, we are celebrating a victory that has changed history forever. So let us celebrate that by singing, Yours be the glory, risen, conquering Son. Let us join together in a time of prayer for others. Let us pray. Risen Lord, we bring before you the aches of our hearts. As we pray, Lord, we are mindful that amid so much that is going on, prayer is often all we can do at the moment. Remind us, Lord, that prayer is important work a vital ministry. We pray especially for those suffering from COVID-19 and for the medical teams, the doctors, nurses, health professionals, researchers and so many others involved in caring for the sick and the dying and searching for a cure. Lord, as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we acknowledge that we are yours. We pray for our politicians. We know, Lord, that they are doing their best in a, in a time of uncertainty. Guide them, Lord, 
as they make decisions for all the people of our land. Guide them, Lord, as they reach out to all the people of our land. We pray especially, Lord, for those on welfare, those on our streets, those who are finding it tough during these extraordinary times. Be with them, Lord, and carry them through these days. And Lord, we pray for those who are near and dear to us. Walk with them, Lord, and hold them high during these challenging hours. In your holy name we pray. Amen. As we prepare today to re-enter the world, let us remember that we are a changed and transformed people. We are victorious because of what Jesus has done for us. And he calls us now to live as Easter people renewed and re-energised for his mission in the world. Our last hymn that we can join in singing or just meditate on is Crown Him With Many Crowns.
So let us go out to live as Easter people, joyful that love and life has overcome fear and death forever. Alleluia. The blessing. The grace of Christ attend you. The love of God surround you. The Holy Spirit keep you this day and forever. Alleluia. Amen.